Great. Again, um, I'm Susie Waffler, Regional Coordinator for Jazz and Southwest. It is now my great privilege to introduce our moderator, De uh, Professor Deborah Nadulman Landis. Uh, Professor Landis is a renowned costume designer, historian, and endowed shareholder at UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television. She's also the founding director of the David C. Copley Center for Costume Design, also at UCLA. She received her MFA in costume design from UCLA and her PhD in the history of design from the Royal College of Art in London. Her distinguished career includes memorable work on many, many iconic films, including such classics as Animal House, The Blues Brothers, um, An American Werewolf in London, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Trading Places, uh, Three Amigos, Coming to America, for which she was nominated for an Academy Award. She also designed the unforgettable costumes for the groundbreaking music video, Michael Jackson's Thriller. Um, She's a two-term past president of the Costume Designers Guild, Local 892, a past governor of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. She sits on the board of the National Film Preservation Foundation. She's the author of six books, including Dressed, A Century of Hollywood Costume Design, Film Craft, Costume Design, Hollywood Sketchbook, A Century of Costume Illustration, and the catalog for her landmark exhibition, Hollywood Costume which she curated at the Victorian Albert Museum in London in 2012. She's the editor-in-chief of the upcoming three-volume Bloomsbury Encyclopedia of Film and Television Costume Design coming out this year. And now, without further ado, I turn it over to our fabulous moderator um, and mistress of ceremonies for today, Professor Deborah Nadulman Landis. Thank you, Deborah. It's all right. Thank you very much, Susan, and thank you to the Jane Austen Society of America for this invitation and opportunity to talk about our work. Uh, we, we planned this almost, I think it was almost two years ago, couldn't do it last year. And here we are virtual, which is a silver lining really because we can reach so many people over Zoom and then have a recording of this event. I'd like to take a moment to commemorate Juneteenth and the end of slavery in the United States. And for the first time, we're finally recognizing Juneteenth as a federal holiday. As we celebrate this historic moment, let's indulge in Bridgerton and enjoy the freedom to enjoy this inspired and invented story. So I am now going to share my screen and we can get started. So Bridgerton is based on Julia Quinn's worldwide sensation, these romance novels. And costume designers are tasked, our brief is to bring stories to life and the people in the text to life. And these, these novels have fans uh, all over the world and they have been published in many, many, many languages. The Duke and I has become the Bridgerton series and Ellen will tell us the background of this. And when Shonda Rhimes actually bought these books, it was quite some years ago. Well, this is what's happened. Um, Magazines and websites are full of the headlines like these that you see on the screen right now. Um, Bridgerton has started and has ignited a worldwide fashion trend. And um, it is the top 10 of every single country where Netflix is available with the exception of Japan. That includes 83 countries, including the US, UK, Brazil, India, South Africa, and the series has hit number one in each one of these. 
So here is the Regency related search items, uh, which rose dramatically after Bridgerton appeared. List attributed a 123% spike in searches for corsets. Long gloves are up 23%. Shawls, 124%. A 93% increase in empire line dresses, puff sleeves dresses up, up 26%, crystal earrings up 34%, tiara searches 357%, thank you Ellen, and pearl and feather headbands skyrocketed 49%. And this is all during our pandemic and our lockdown in a period where no one was going anywhere. This is just some of the fashion influence, just easy fashion influence that you see um, on your searches now, not even couture. Uh, Bridgerton inspired weddings seem to be a thing. And I think this one is the next, thanks to my uh, the head of research, Natasha Rubin, she pulled this. This is... Twitter to TikTok. All right, we have to stop was just delicious. These are fans who just want to play out their fantasies uh, with their Bridgerton inspired clothes. Let me tell you a little bit about my friend, Ellen Mirajnik, who I admire so much. Born and raised in New York City, Ellen pursued the study of design at the New York School of Visual Arts and the Parsons School of Design. She started in fashion, but it wasn't long before she set her sights on a career in Hollywood. Beginning a long and distinguished career that has spanned three decades, probably closer to four now. She has been nominated twice for BAFTA and Emmy Awards, winning the Emmy for Behind the Candelabra. She has won multiple Costume Designers Guild Awards, including for The Nick, Maleficent Mistress of Evil, and in 2016, she was honored with the richly deserved Career Achievement Award. She has designed for esteemed directors, including Steven Soderbergh, Steven Spielberg, Oliver Stone, Paul Verhoeven, Tony and Ridley Scott, Catherine Bigelow, J.J. Abrams, and Angelina Jolie. Her diverse range of films includes every genre, including science fiction, Starship Troopers, Cloverfield, the classics, Basic Instinct, Fatal Attraction, Speed, Face Off, Chronicles of Riddick, Wall Street, Wall Street Money Never Sleeps, talk about fashion trends, Lucky Logan, and The Greatest Showman. In 2020, she designed let Them All Talk, starring Meryl Streep, and of course, Bridgerton. This fall, Sony will release the contemporary movie musical of Cinderella, and she recently finished production and design on Steven Soderbergh's movie, Kimmy. I would like to introduce my friend, Ellen Mirajnik, but wait, Ellen, I have to dress for the moment. Give me a minute. <laughs> okay, now I've got my tiara on. Oh, I wish I had one. Oh, oh just come over here. I've got a million. <laughs> All right. Ellen Mirajnik. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, you have to undo your screen. Okay. There we are. All right. So, Ellen, I I have a. Let me here. Let me see your tiara first. <laughs> there it is. 
so pretty, so pretty. One of 374, I'm sure. <laughs> Is that how many you had? I don't know. <laughs> so, Ellen, let's start talking about um, let's start talking about how you got involved with um, with uh, with Bridgerton. Tell us the background of how you got involved in Bridgerton, and then I'll start sharing when we go back to your color palette and your mood boards. But tell us how how did you get involved originally with Shondaland? Um, I got um, involved with Shondaland actually a while ago, a long time ago. So we knew each other. And that's a very important element of this story. We knew each other. We knew each other's sensibilities. We knew our, each other's aesthetic um, wants um, and delights. And I actually would come into um, Shondaland every now and then and help them with different kinds of projects that might have been stuck in a particular place. So what happens is that when it happened to be Bridgerton, um, the very wonderful people at Bridgerton in production and, and creative development called and said, we don't need you like in two weeks. Can you please help us? Um, and see if you want to be involved with this. Would you read the, the first script? Tell us what you think. Tell us how um, you want to, I'm going to just, it, pardon me one second, because it's just, a, I'm going to change the view. Oh, it is on speaker view. Okay. Um, it is, it was a very, very, very complex pilot that they wrote, but they, it wasn't just a pilot. It was a pilot for a, an eight episode series that had been picked yeah. up to begin with. No, so I'm it was the world. It was just a world of, of everything. And so um, I read it. I was very intrigued by it. I met with Chris Van Dusen who adapted Julia Quinn's novels and Sarah Fisher and Betsy Beers. And, and we talked about it. It was clearly expensive and that needed to be a note that was clearly heard from the very, very beginning. And that what it would take to actually create this world. There were things that Chris Van Dusen and Shondaland said, with, this is, we do not want under any circumstances to create a history lesson. This is not what we're after. And that was a very, that's a very broad and very clear um, brief. This is not an historical replication of Regency England and um, it is whatever you have to do, do, of course, but no history. So wait, I have to interrupt you there because that that's a huge point to be making right now. Yeah. So when you, you told me that they had bought the novels quite some time ago. Shonda bought them, a, 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 I don't know the year that she bought them, but it was a, num, a, a considerable amount of years prior to, we're talking about the end of 2018, that we got together and spoke about this towards 2019. But she had bought them a number of years and they were her favorite novels, just favorite. Think about what she does. And then these novels of eight books were her favorite. So um, it, it says quite a lot. It says quite a lot. And, and so, Chris, who was one of Shonda's um, um, members of her company and her writing teams was tasked with, he fell in love with them as well. And he was tasked to interpreting them, adapting them for the screen. And yes, it was not to be a history lesson. And then wait, how involved was the original author? 
But did she did she see the adaptation? Did she see what? Oh, Julia, Julia's a Julia Quinn is a very without a question of a doubt. She is a member of that family. She is a member of the Shondaland family. Nothing is hidden from her. Um, she you you have to understand these books were on the shelf for 20 years. Funny enough, she had the lot her largest fan base was South American. The Brazilians went wild for it, went wild for it. And it was really substantial. It was a substantial fan base. But besides that, Julia was there as an observer. And whatever, you know, whatever Chris needed in terms of support in any number of different areas, it was a very open relationship. So that was a very, very nice part. It wasn't like you were working in a corner in the dark and don't tell this one and don't tell that one, you know, and um, Julia's thrilled. All of her books have gone to number one now and have gone <laughs> through the printing. So I think that there is nothing, Julia just applauds continually, continually. Uh, yeah. And it's quite nice because she's afforded another opportunity to do even more than she's done up to, up to now. She's, I think that she's a woman, not she's not very old and she's not very young and she's she's a delight she always has a smile on her face so do you, do you mean like a woman like us without a question without a question <laughs> she could come and join our group anytime she's just a delight she really is a, and she is enamored with this whole process mm -hmm. you know she is just so um so curious and fascinated by how it all comes together and how it certainly it was her first time around this wheel. So, so let me get this right. So you, you had a relationship with Shondaland mm -hmm. and then, um, and they said, well, Ellen can do this because Ellen has the kind of um, Im uh, imaginative, uh, imaginative vigor that could take this to another place. So how did you start and how did you start? Should I, turn, should I start to show you research now? Well, I'll, I'll just say this and then you can. I mean, it all went along the, that manner. First and foremost, before the research came, when I said we need to have enough money. Money. Money, money was a very important element because I had worked in London previously for a couple of years and knew what were what was in the costume houses all through Europe. Um, and I knew that there was nothing there except possibly a sample. <laughs> and so they needed a lot of money um, and we'd have to make everything. That doesn't mean that it's going to cost more money. I mean, that's a misnomer that sometimes gets like, oh, you had to make everything that must have cost like triple the amount. No, 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 no. Sometimes it's far more efficient um, and less expensive, frankly. Um, but that being said, they we had to budget it. We budgeted from one show and guest on points for the, the, the seven remaining scripts. And they were taken aback. They were quite, they were taken aback. It was a, a hefty number. And uh, it was in dollars. And so when I agreed to do it, and um, it was a great challenge. I knew I had to do it because a challenge and, and building a world does not come across the desk that often. And it hadn't been anything that I really had you know, really done before. So they said, would you go to London before they really said, yes, 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 yes. Would you go to London and really make sure that there's nothing and, and find a crew? And I said, of course. And so I went to London, found the two people that were very, very important at that time. We went on a recce, a scout through all the houses, did another budget that was higher than the one in the United States and had a meeting and we and said, you have to be in or out. And they were in. And as Betsy Beers fondly calls me um, or did at that time, I was her Waterloo because 
it was hefty. It was hefty. But then we started to design and we put the team together and then we started because uh, the team is so, so important. Figured out how we could do it. What would be the best way? Because we had to create a costume house. Yes. And to create a costume house is for an amount of people that will be in and out of these episodes was a very high number, a very high number. So we had to be very prepared. Ellen, I have to, I want, I want you to explain, um, or maybe let me tease this out. So okay. producers or the studio or the network tend to think that for whatever they manage to be, for whatever story they manage to be telling, the costume designer can go to something like um, a department store, uh, Bloomingdale's of, of costuming, which is a big costume house, and rent whatever rack that happens to be so that you would happen to, you would go to Angel's Costume House in London, which is a huge, Mm -hmm. costume stock and there would already be a Bridgerton rack and you could rent it and 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 the truth is that costume houses in Britain and in Italy and in New York and in Los Angeles do have a rack of clothes that sort of look like the first decade second decade of the 19th century that might work but they don't work for Bridgerton and that oh. does not exist it did not, it did not, it, first of all, they didn't have anything on the racks because there were other shows out. That was number one. Number two, we, would, we were tasked with creating a world. And when I say we're building the world, it means from inside and out, meaning that there are so many people in the Bridgerton family and not only in the family of Bridgerton, but in other families and other people that we wanted to create a world that would take, would sweep you into um, fantasy or, or, or the equivalent of a romantic novel, yeah. I think best put. And with that and the edict of not an historical representation. And the next piece was a bonnetless universe. What? A bonnetless universe. <laughs> and so that if you take those two pieces, you just listen to what that is. And I, of course, remember the faces and the expressions on the faces of the people who said that. You're not going to go near it. And there is a world that has to be created. And so that needed to be a palette it needed to be different fabrication. It needed to be um, a different influence. And as we create and we do research and we see what is 100% correct, it's only through knowing, I believe, that what is 100% correct that you can abstract, that you can then feel like you can go into many different uh, interpretations of how you want to portray that. And in the beginning, I realized at one point, um, I've said this before, but I, I must give her credit because I love her work. Um, there's an, a young Irish uh, fine artist, painter named Genevieve Biggis, who I, she paints and she illustrates. And I saw her illustrations first. I think it was in a Vogue. And she had illustrated a Chanel salon of present day. But there was a, a feeling that was intoxicating. So I had to look her up. And there before me were these paintings and palette that I fell in love with. And I said, this is how we go. This is how we go into wow. the world. How do, you, how do you spell her name? Her last name, Figgis, F-I-G-G-I-S. Her first name, um, Genevieve, uh, G-E-N-I-E-V-E. -E. Okay. Um, and 
what was was really intoxicating about her is the color palette was so fresh it was so alive it was very very similar actually to the regency period that of course we don't necessarily get to see too often because we have we see dusted a dusted period we yeah. see a faded period we see a period that is just kind of beige and bonneted, you know? And that's not really true that we've later found out. Genevieve's paintings, the figurativeness of the paintings, because she did do little scenarios that were similar to what we were going to do. But what the key to her paintings were were two things. One was the color palette. And the second was that she blurred the lines. Everything had a kind of, you know, you look at it and you don't necessarily, oh, that looks blurry. But in truth, wow. things blurred, but it was perfect. It felt fresh to me. It felt exactly what the world had to be. And now, of course, it was up. That was the initial inspiration. Without okay. seeing that work, I don't know what we would have done. But then the research. Let me go. Let All me right, go ahead. Through. All right, so let me share. And we're going to look at, we are going to look at your, we're gonna look at your, at lookbook. your lookbook. All right. Now this is the book that I shared with the all of Shondaland. I was the first hired. I did this book with my co-genius, other half of my brain, John Glazer, and every, everything that you see before you, everyone agreed to at the get-go. So I thought this was an interesting choice because this is a uh, late 19th century painting of the early 19th century. So even this, is interpretive, right? So this is a, this painting itself is an anachronism because it was done as a romantic version of an earlier time. Which best represents the period. So this is the palette that we worked through and um, felt that we needed to shift into. And as you see, there are many different tonalities certainly starting in a bright tonality and going through the different, um, the different layers to get to different combinations and different um, possibilities. It felt, felt modern, it felt fresh. And I might say one of, the, one of the key elements of the brief was also that, it, that um, Bridgerton was was the big hope for Bridgerton was that it would be aspirational and it would be aspirational for a modern audience, a new modern audience that might not have been familiar. And so it would, this is really all about color. It's not necessarily about figurative images, but there, there's details within this, this range of color that we just found fascinating and, and included. And then we, we went off from there. And it is very common for costume designers to, to be inspired by everything, mm -hmm. uh, natural, industrial, every part of the world around us. Without a question, without a question. And these, on the following pages are the images that we composed um, to actually create the feeling for the world of Bridgerton that were seen by everyone, explored. And what the biggest, the biggest reason for doing this was so that everybody be on the same page. And so you shared these with the production designer, the cinematographer. The production, there was no production. Deborah, this is what I'm saying. The <laughs> building the world was really a great, great, great challenge 
for us, it was thrilling because we were able to build the world first. It was you. It was yeah. you, Ellen. All right. And then and then did the actors, what was the casting like? Had you met the had they no, 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 there was nothing. Nobody, nothing. nobody. Zero. <laughs> zero. Zero. When all of this was created, there was zero. There was zero involvement other than the um creator, Chris, and wow. Chandeland. And Chandeland. Okay. That that's it. The production designer was hired later. Wow. The photographers, the directors, everybody was later. This was the, we were able, this is a very rare thing. You know, I am really spoiled now. I am, I cannot tell you how spoiled I am because we had everything at our, um, at our, um, in, we had everything available to us and we could make many different many different decisions without anybody saying that nah, I don't like that. Well, I, I have to say again to our um, guests today that the reason it's so spoiling is that your Chris Van Dusen and Chandelin came to you and said, who are these people? What is this world? What, bring these people to life, please. Let us know what our world looks like. And usually, and usually in, in our world, in the world of entertainment for film and television, that's the production designer. It's, it's more yeah. about the where than about the who. And yeah. Ellen, you created the who, the people of this world, right? That was your role. Yeah. Well, it was also the, the people and the color palette and where to go and what it felt like, what it looked mm -hmm. like. I don't know if you have any other, images up but what it felt like what different what different groups could feel like what what mm -hmm. the opulence could feel like what the simpleness could feel like there is a bonnet in that in that picture but I, <laughs> at that time people said no, 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 that's not going to be in the show right 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 I had, I had to clarify but it is it, that's why I'm saying it is such an extraordinary situation because we don't ever get to have this much freedom. And I do use the word freedom on in celebration of today's um, holiday, I would say, but we had a, a masterful amount of freedom and we needed to go first because we had to create a costume house. Yes. And, and so the costumes had to come from someplace and, and we had to move very, very quickly, even though we had five months. It would be uh, impossible to rent these clothes because the whole world had to be cohesive and look like everybody fit together. You can't take old clothes made from an old, something that was meant for something that was 1813 from another world. Right. It wouldn't right. have fit into the world of Bridgerton. No, the Bridgerton world was a very rarefied world and very, very special and very, um, what was really interesting, I think, for the world that we created and then others joining in, meaning the production designer was thrilled. He, that, he then knew what to do. The um, hairstylist, the brilliant Mark um, Pil Pilchner, he knew what to do. Um, the cinematographers, of course, knew what to do, but my team, all of my team knew exactly from this little Bible that we created, they knew what to do. They knew what the world was. And from that, they were all inspired. Sure. Now, my team was a full British team. How many? How many people on the crew, on the cost in the costume department? How many people were there to support the costuming? Well, all together, after it was all said and done, this can this includes the standbys that actually took care of the costumes and the and the actors um, when we were shooting. There were two hundred and thirty eight people <gasps> on the costume on the in the costume department. In the I said all together, all together in the costume department alone, just in costume and creation, wow. there were 
about 110 to begin, I mean, in, in the bulk of the making, wow. um, because that included within that 110, it did include fitters that had to do every single costume that you see in the entire show was bespoke. Everything was done. The, 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 stand, the background actors would come in and they were fit and handled and, and designed as, as with as much time as a principal player. Mm. So there were, I, I, we had jewelers, we had embellishers, we had fitters, we had alterations, we had five cutters, we had, this is Queen Charlotte. Um, and of course, these are all paintings also um, before interpretation. But actually she's, I think that actually Queen Charlotte is closest to the paintings than anybody else. But of course, of, of Bridgerton, Bridgetized by the, her colorations and her hair, which was the mark of genius, I think. Yeah, I, had, I really think it's the mark of genius. But that being said, there were so there were five cutters. So then there are their teams. There are three um, tailors, and there were there was um, the most amazing, brilliant Mister Pearl, who created corsets for our principal players. Um, so we had a lot of people when we were going when we began to go, but we had to, in the beginning, what we had to do is buy as much fabric as we could. And that was not easy. There is not that much fabric in the world. Um, <laughs> it really isn't. I'm not sorry. that much fabric in the world for Bridgerton. Not for Bridgerton, not for the first season of Bridgerton for certain, because everything had to be made. So we, we, we sourced from every possible mill that you could, from every possible city worldwide that you could, and decided to do, we needed to create the costume house, don't forget. So we decided to do a, uh, what we call a stack and stitch. Oh, you have to tell everybody about that. This okay. is absolutely fascinating in terms of um, trying to create trying to create this costume house or this store of yes. costumes to be able to use a huge number of costumes. And one more second, Ellen, you told me that originally when you were creating the budget, you asked them, do you want it when they when they flinched and you originally gave them the budget, they said, um, you said, well, do you want to cut a ball? Do, would you cut a ball or two? And they didn't want to cut the ball. So this stack and stitch was so brilliant. Please explain. Okay, so a stack and stitch, um, and I didn't coin the phrase. <laughs> I don't remember where it came from. Um, feel free. A stack and stitch is when you take a silhouette you take a one particular style and you use that one particular style. You could have 50 different fabrics. You could have a hundred, you can have 20. It doesn't matter how much. And all of that is laid up and cut in this one style. So you do that with three to four different styles so that you can get a bulk amount of co of costumes and silhouettes in the house as quickly as possible. It still took about two months, but three months, but we did get it into the house. So you had all of the basic dresses hanging in a range of colors that were, oh, it was just delightful to look at. It was so pretty and really lovely. And we did the same for men in men's jackets, in men's waistcoats, in men's trousers. And that was the easiest way to create the largest amount of clothing that you could. When it came to the ball clothes, 
However, they were, they were also stacked and stitched. However, those clothes went to one or two very specialized people because they were different types of fabrics to work with. But I think what I also shared with you, Deborah, is that now we have the basis of a costume house. Mm -hmm. And I started to design the principles. And it didn't really, I was really happy, but it didn't feel the way I really thought I needed to go. I had to do something else. So I was sitting in my office and I was staring at a magenta silk dress. And I went, this is just never going to do. Now, granted, it wasn't for a principal. It was for a background player. But I said, this is never going to do. And then to the left of me was a fabric bin of different colored tools, silk tools and, and silk oval, and organza overlays. And I just started to layer the tools up over this magenta silk, very pretty silhouetted dress. You can see it in, in this picture. You can see the tool over, over the dress. So I, I, and I, then I called everybody around and they smiled and I said, I think we got it. And that was, that was actually the beginning of Bridgerton. So we had passed the logist, we had passed the overall intention. We had, we, we were through the process of still creating the costume house, but then we got then in that moment, it was clear what the idea of Bridgerton was about. And that actually related back to Genevieve's paintings, because what that tool did, what that overlay did, it blurred the lines. There wasn't a sharp line. And that I was after. So after that, we went, oh, it was hogs in heaven, going out and getting every transparency, tools and organzas and organdies and, and, and as you, embroidered um, nettings and so on, so that we can make layers upon layers upon layers and change colors so colors could be changeable. And then we then changed the line, the empire line slightly. We changed it in a way to be a little semicircular mm. so that with these overlays, we could have a fluidity. Mm. And I think it was, and then of course the embellishments and the embellishments and the embellishments. And it was, it was great fun and everyone then was bespokely done and there was there was no room for hesitancy you know it was go big or go home yeah. and that's really what we continued to work towards and frankly all of my whole British staff and all of our actors that were British came in and said wow, what are we doing? Wow, <laughs> there's no bonnet? There, wow, what do you mean there's no bonnet? No, there's no bonnet. And then the, the hair designer would come in and show them why there couldn't be a, a bonnet. And um, we would take them through the process of determining colors and shapes and forms and seeing if they could walk and and they were like all every single actor no matter how much work they have done previous to the show or not were they were like kids in a candy store and yeah. it so helped them open up but really open up to what they were about to do in a way that um it brought a different kind of oxygen to their ability to create the characters. 
No, I, I love that, Ellen, because it is a, a bull in a china shop. It's a bull in a very fragile little china shop. It's completely mold breaking. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and in terms of um, EDI, equity, you know, diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. this show is just, um, it, it, it has that kind of excitement and modernity to it. Yes. And uh, they were so lucky to have you because you kind of knocked it all around. It's like a New Yorker <laughs> coming into it. It's true. It's yeah. it's really, really true. Nothing I mean, was precious. Nothing was nothing precious. precious coming into Bath and then just breaking all that Bath China, right? Yes. Yes. So, um, yes. I mean, the actors too, when did you have this casting? Um, the casting began at a fairly, I mean, look at her. I, mean, I know. When she walked into the crazy. room in this episode, I laughed so hard. It is the biggest laugh in the world. It is the, you know, and, and Golda, who plays Queen Charlotte, she is so such she is a bull in a china shop but she is the most fabulous bull in a china shop in real life so she, you give her an idea and she will blow it up it's so it's thrilling to watch her eyes kind of um generate some excitement that you don't know where it's going to go but i think that the actors as i remember it it was a fairly okay period of time. It was, look at her. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> look at her. My goodness. Um, it was a fairly good amount of time that we had um, when they first came in the room. I don't remember it being like a week before or any of sometimes that nonsense that we have to deal with. Um, we had them in enough time to be able to develop the character. And like, for example, Lady Featherington, Polly Walker, mm -hmm. um, her, the, the shape of her body and her silhouette, we had to work on quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for Mr. Pearl, I don't know how we would have gotten there, truthfully. I wonder if we go back to her right there. Yeah. Um, she has a substantial size bosom that need, and she's very, very conscious also of how she moves and what she, um, what certain things can do or not do for her. So we had to take liberties that were just as bold as the rest of the show in terms of the shape of her bosom, the shape of her upper torso. Yes. Um, and it was by, ver it was Mr. Pearl. It was Mr. Pearl all the way because we had to put her bosom in a, inside a casing that felt, it felt proportionate. I think that's the best way to put it, that it didn't feel as if the bosom was really sitting under her chin which unfortunately in the very, very beginning before we really knew her body, we had, wasn't really a good choice. So we started to look at alternatives. Now, once getting her silhouette down, we then said, well, we have to really go bold with her and she will be Elizabeth Taylor and she <laughs> will be Joan Collins. She will be all of those ladies. And she loved it. She loved it. She said, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. And she was all in. And so, you know, every single one of these actors were just charming and lovely and really had the same um, response. Do it, do it, do it, do it. I want to be better, better. But I mean, they were, became competitive at a certain sure. point. Like who has what and why don't I have that? But I mean, Polly was sensational, and all of these girls were sensational. And oh, and sh and 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 Golda was a dream boat. As was, I mean, this prince, this this charming prince. He came, he came to stay. They kept him like for six months, and he worked like six times. I mean, it's kind of crazy, but. You know, it was, I, I tell you another influence 
because I don't know if I'm jumping around or if you want to touch no, on. No, no, I, I, I hold, hold that thought. Hold okay. that thought. I want to say two things. The first thing is every woman who is a guest on this call, on this Zoom call, understands uh, or should understand the proportions of her own body. And that we know that um, I look terrible in shirtwaist dresses. Everybody knows or should know what flatters their body and their own proportions. And that has to be understood as also part of a de costume designer's brief. Not only are we designing for every correct period, but we also somehow have to make, have to flatter that actor and have to make that actor feel comfortable in their clothes because they're not gonna do their job if they're not comfortable. So working with Mrs. Featherington and getting her to feel great about how she looks in this period when her body may not be right for the period. At all. Eat at, all. at all, you had to manage that. And that was part of your job also. Yes. So I did want to get that in. Yes, without a question. It's a great right? point. It's a great point because, you know, you're dealing in this, in Bridgerton, yeah. you are dealing with modern actors, mm -hmm. with modern actors. Um, Gold has a particular body. Polly has a particular body. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, others who are young have different bodies, you know, um, Penelope was a, you know, has a very particular body. Yes. All of that is, is something that you have to kind of, um, ascertain first, feel out their personalities what their likes, their dislikes, what, they, what they're self-conscious about. Really truthfully, how do they take off their clothes? Do they go behind the screen or do they do it in front of you? Yes. It's learn a lot that way. Yeah. And then you almost want, in, in our experience, we almost wanted them to close their eyes and then open them once we did our work. Um, but they really want, they were so curious. They wanted to see how they would become um, transformed to the 19th century. And then they went on to say, well, I could wear this dress out now. I could do this. I, and so once these young actors were so very, very, very present in um, the idea of where we were going and what we were doing, they would kind of, become chameleons in their bodies and allow us to do what was needed. As, as was Golda and, and, and Violet and um, Lady Featherington, all of the older actors were, were the same. Everybody knew what, was, what our mission was. And, and I must say, um, not to sound um, un-American, but, I have to say working with British actors who mostly work, they have a range. It is not just of modern pieces. They work in period, different types of periods and so on more frequently than a lot of American actors. They are used to being um, transformed into another time. Mm. The difference with Bridgerton was, is that this was timeless <laughs> in that this didn't necessarily fit into their prescription for Regency as they knew it. I'm, I, I wanna, there are some questions. So, and I think that they're pretty interesting. Um, okay. it's, it's about the court. I'm gonna go back. The court being in 18th century. Uh, right. Oh, that's me. I didn't wanna show you that. That was me. Why? Those are fabulous. I, I, yeah. Well, I actually, uh, you know, this is how I was going to end because I felt that this green and purple cake was so Mrs. Featherington. It definitely is. It can turn into a hat. Not a bonnet, but a hat. I know. I looked at these and when I was looking at this, 
this is what you made for me with no calories. So I, <laughs> so I was thinking, you know, if if I think about uh, if I think about Bridgerton and watching the series as I did, I just think you created confectionery. Mm -hmm. and, it was a uh, feast. Right? It was a, it was a feast. And this is what, if, I mean, that would have been, Ellen, in, in retrospect, after seeing the show, this would have been my mood board. <laughs> oh, fab. That's fabulous. I'm hungry looking at it. I and thought. What we hoped for. I mean, you're not a, you, maybe you're not a pastry chef, but you are a pastry chef. So that's what I really thought. <laughs> anyway, the question, the question really was, why, what was the decision to put Queen Charlotte in 18th century uh, clothing? And who did that come from? And how did you make this decision? Well, doing the research for Queen Charlotte, what we learned was that she stayed in 18th century um, costume, 18th century wear, all through her reign. She oh. did not change. And it was when she came into the court and married King George, um, the madman, but we didn't know that then. She stayed in, in this in, in, in this silhouette and did not change. I think eventually she did change. Um, I can't give you a date on that. It didn't have what to do with our uh, period, but it wasn't, it only came from the research. And then, and then there was another question. And of course uh, you and I are well aware of the answer for this, but the question is, um, how, do you use any vintage fabrics and I'm just gonna say, and why not? And then the other question is, what about upcycled and source textiles? Well, I would say that yes, you use vintage fabric when you can find it, you know, and, and we were in a period, this was pre-pandemic, so we were in a pretty, um, a full period of being able to secure lots of different types of things. Yes, we can, and yes, so we definitely use vintage, but we don't use vintage. I must make this point. I, we don't use vintage to just for a particular character or just for a particular costume because it would be correct. I, not on this show. I'll use, if the fabric is a vintage fabric, but it looks like it belongs on the most outlandish of, of costumes, I'll use it. It won't necessarily be precious. So that's, that's the difference of the preciousness. And um, the second question was about upscaled and say again, I mean, upsourced and what, what, what was the other part of the question of the fabrics, Deb? Sourcing, um, resourcing textiles. So using old uh, textiles and upcycling. We, we do, in the course of Bridgerton, everything, there was nothing that wasn't used. This was divine ecology, nothing was wasted. And so whether it was old, new, vintage, precious, how can we use it? Where is that other piece of lace that I might want? Oh, can I layer it with something else? Can I can I surge the fabric together? Oh, I want to create my own fabric. Can I layer these different things together? It, everything was possible. Here's another question: um, How much how much is the design specific to the casting? And um, if one of the main actors had to uh, had to pull out. Uh, would you have to refit the original costume or uh, how much are the clothes tied to the people who are wearing them? Well, they're hundred percent tied because they're hundred percent made for them. If an actor had to pull out or an actress had to pull out, it, it, it would depend on who the actor, what, what, who was the replacement and who was the original. 
Mm. You know, it, I wouldn't necessarily re- make a new costume if the previous actor had was able to fit that with minor alterations or maybe no alterations, who mm. knows? But um, everything is made for each actor from soup to nuts. I mean, that includes shoes. Now, there, then there are two questions about, about color. Mm-hmm. A, did you dye a lot of fabrics? And then B, did you camera test them? Um, yes, we dyed quite a few fabrics. Um, and no, we didn't camera test anything. <laughs> this is, <laughs> we did it. Oh, well, wait, 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 I, wait. We did camera test a few of the principles, but we did not camera test the costumes. They were only camera tested in one costume. All right. And, and, um, and then I have a question uh, about your, your sensitivity to working with actors of every color and shade. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did, now our guests may not be aware then when we're working with um, people of all different color skin tones, you really tend to stay away from white. How, how, how did you work with, um, how did you work with your leads in terms of color? Did you specifically design for your cast according to their skin tone? Well, I mean, that is, that does not have what to do with um, different races, frankly. It okay. has just what to do with the person in front of me. And when um, I, 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 I mean, I, I, think of it all as one. There is no separation of anything in my mind when going into a room with a character who might not be, you know, um, maybe you thought was going to be one thing and it turns out to be another another thing. Color, I love color so very, very much, but with each and every member of this cast, no matter what color they were. The colors, we we had the first session when they came to be measured was all about what colors they could wear. So it was only, it was was a universal, um, a universal, uh, a universal part of our process whereby we layered different colors to see what was going to be best on them and then what fit into our world of telling our story. It, and, and of course it was all individual. It was because of it was all individual. I mean, Ruby might be a, a perfect example, the cousin who- Wait, comes, who's Ruby? Who's Ruby? She's, she's the cousin who comes to the Featheringtons. Yes. Okay? And she's a light-skinned girl and she came from the country. She didn't have that much money. Sure. Um, where is she? Yeah. I thought that, wait, I, there, that, that, that lady. Um, mm-hmm. She didn't have that much money, but then she would be dressed by Lady Featherington. Could she wear yellow? Yellow's not an easy color to wear under any stretch of the imagination. Um, and, but she could, and there were tones of yellow that she could wear. There were tones of pink that she could wear, but it wasn't, that's what we'd hoped for going in. But of course you make the adjustments when the actress or actor is in the room. Um, a couple more questions. And the questions are, um, the, the best question is also always, so will the costumes be used for the next series? And, and then, what happens to the clothes after the series is over? Well, the series is probably not going to be over for now. We know at least for three more seasons. So, but what happens in the third and fourth season is they move to another time. Oh, yes. So it moves up because it focuses on um, the next set of kids. So now it's on Anthony. They're still basically in the same period of time. And then it moves to two of the next in line. 
you know, that's the, that's the source of that's the source that runs through the entire series of books. But um, yes, the the clothes are being used because it was a costume house we created for the second the second season, and they were tasked with reinter not reinterpreting but doing something more to them. So whatever we did to them to begin with, they might appear differently the next season. Okay. And what about, what about, here we are, we're with the Jane Austen Society. Did yes. Jane, so did Jane Austen or her world ever come up in discussions with, with your showrunner or with Shonda? Never. I'm very sorry. I'm very, very honored to be here today, ladies. I really am. But it was never brought up. The only person that brought it up was um, the lovely, the lovely actress who played Eloise and Jesse. And she thought that it was going to be, she thought she was walking into a Jane Austen world and was at first shocked, was at first shocked quite, but I'm not in a bad way, but she, she didn't really understand our world until she got there. And also um, Bessie who played um, Prudence, she also was shocked a bit you know, because they both had been in series, I believe that were more Jane Austen centric um, shows, um, but they, it was never brought up. It was never brought up as an, as an example of, we do not want to do this. Ooh. We want something else. So, I mean, I think the Jane Austen world is quite well respected. Um, Colin Firth was brought up. He was brought up. Of course he should be brought up all the time, and I think every that it, day. And, and, and Colin was, I think, really made a huge impression on Chris Van Dusen as he was writing. And it was when he was young, I should say. And then of course, writing his characters. And I can't imagine how there weren't things that were subliminally, um, brought up through our, you know, uh, learning about how to build this world. Um, even a bonnet, for example, a bonnet in our world turned into a shape of a headpiece, of a hair accessory. It was still using that same semicircular shape, but how could we reinterpret it. So it sat on the head in a way that you didn't think that the bonnet was falling backwards. It just was part of the hair design with flowers and, and et cetera. So there's nothing, we didn't go, oh, we can't go there. We knew we couldn't go there, but I think that it is divine ecology because nothing was wasted. You know, not a, not a bit of research, not a bit of understanding of Jane Austen, nor was it um, wasted on any realities. I mean, we went through the v &A, so many Victoria Albert Museum, so many times, so many times. But what really, really influenced us quite a bit was the Dior show. Yes. <laughs> and, and, I mean, we saw it four or five times. But what, but what influence that show had, for example, on the balls, on all of the balls there, there it's eight balls, seven balls, was because mostly, most of the dresses are exactly the same. Most of the background dresses are worn throughout all of the balls, but certain things are changed, slight. But what was very, very clear that when you went through the Dior show as the, at the, in the end room where there were, what were there? I don't know, 75 dresses possibly. 
the lighting was brilliant. The yeah. lighting was extraordinary. It went from pre-dawn all through night, the, eve, the night sky. And every single dress looked different depending on the light. So we used that clue as well to help us design all of the dresses for the balls and to see what we could change out. That would be very, very simple. So, Ellen, I think what you're describing is, or I mean, I saw that Dior show, I saw it in Paris and I saw it at the V&A and that night sky with the shooting stars and looking up and seeing projected the the horoscope in the heavens mm -hmm. and the sparkle was just magic mm -hmm. and creating that magic that fairy tale that magic and after all this is not supposed to be the real world this That's is supposed right. to be the magical world of the lives of the bridgertons and the featheringtons and it's magic it's fairy tale it's there's so much sparkle and you brought all of that sparkle and and it's, it's light. That's why it made me think of a, just this, this, this groaning board of dessert, right? Yes, yes. I, it, was a, it was a feast on many, many different levels, but the magic and the, and the fantasy and the um, romance. That's it. it. It's the romance. The romance was really important to sweep to be able to sweep the audience, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> pardon me, um, to sweep the audience, no matter what size screen you watch this on, mm. into these stories was the most important element to me. Um, and it was romance, it was romance and it was light and it was beautiful. And, and even though, the Featheringtons had been described as audacious and bold and kind of crossing the line and <clears throat> not really being part of the time. They were had to be beautiful. So they were, they were, they were described as ugly and no, they were never ugly to me. There had to be beauty that existed within a different choice. Best, yeah. the best way I could put it. But I think it's the romance and the fantasy and the magic that we as an audience get attracted to and are so very, very attracted to on many different levels. And of course, when we first saw this, we were in the middle, it was Christmas day and we were all stuck at home and we were in the middle of the pandemic. What I always got a very, very big pleasure out of in terms of the whole entire experience as an end result after everyone saw it was how many people it affected around the world. Yes. Around the world. That it didn't matter, that everyone became one. Everyone became one. And it was a community and it and everyone Actually, every question that I received, every every um, thought about the show or who different girls wanted to be and who different boys wanted to be and so on, it, whether it was India, whether it was Africa, whether it was South Asia, whether it was South America, whether it was Canada, the United States, Europe, it was all, the, it was one. It was one, so I, I, that gave me great pleasure that everyone could be affected in such a positive way during a very, very dark time. Yeah, I mean, to quote, of all people, Ellen, the producer, Jerry Bruckheimer. Said God bless his soul. God bless his soul. But he said something that I have never forgotten and I truly That's love. Fine. He said that we, are in the transportation business because we move people from one place to another. And I think during this period of the pandemic where nobody could go anywhere, Bridgerton allowed us 
to travel to that space and to lose ourselves in that story. So Jerry Bruckheimer. Well, thank Jerry Bruckheimer, I will have to remember that. That is just, that is a quote to remember forever, forever. Um, that's what we do. That's, that, that's a, that is a gift that we are able to participate in. That is a very, very, very beautiful gift for the rest of the world, I think. Yeah, I, me, I go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just, I just, uh, I'm just thinking about uh, other things that people have asked in the chat, like who inspires you, Ellen, and who, uh, what what movies have you loved? What what costume designers have you loved? Who inspires you? What inspires well, you? Do you know what costume designer was my very favorite costume designer? from the beginning of time was Ori Kelly. And I loved Ori Kelly from the moment that I saw Auntie Mame. That oh. was my absolute fit. That, that movie transported me way to someplace else. I was six years old or five years old, but it inspired, I think it inspired my life very, very seriously. I don't ever look back upon, I don't ever look back and think, what was I thinking? No, 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 no. I am, I, I just, Ori Kelly did it for me. Um, I get inspired by so many different things, but by so many different things. I get inspired by nature. I get inspired by the water. I get inspired by um, listening to things, music, music. I, I am, music i absolutely love music and of music of all of all different um genres and i get inspired by people i really get inspired by people and what others have to say and contribute and sometimes i get inspired by the shape of an automobile i can't i mean it goes from one end to the other i'm so sorry to <laughs> say but it does <laughs> Of course, of course. Well, listen, um, I've had a wonderful time. I love oh, you. I, I think the show, I think the show has broken so many rules and God bless you for it. I just love it. I think it's, I think story, if the uh -huh. story works and we can help bring that story to life and then connect connect with a worldwide audience, there is nothing better because it means that everything in that frame is working together. So thank you so much. Susie, any last words? Just thank you, Deborah and Ellen for transporting us to um, this world and to for inspiring us as well. It's really been an incredible talk and just wonderful to hear both of your, what inspires you and what you're, and all the insights into this, this world you've created. Thank you. Oh, it's just such a pleasure to be with you. I, this has just been such a delight. Deborah, I love having conversation with you. It's always so inspired. Deborah is hugely inspiring. Uh -huh. um, but it is so, you ask a question and God knows where you could go. You know, mm -hmm. it's so fun. Uh, it's so fun to, to let your imagination just run wild and be able to have conversation about it. I'm so I'm so happy to have participated today. Thank you, Ellen. I can't wait to see what you do next. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be right there. All okay. right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Thank, Bye -bye. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.